Hey there, Clarksburg. Guess who? It's Gary Keith here. So I just came from the city council meeting. Had a pretty, uh, I guess, controversial issue tonight. And I have a lot to say about it. And I don't think that I, along with a lot of other people that were there to speak, uh, got the proper time that we needed to um, explain our side of this. So, I don't want to make a one-sided video. I think the council meeting is actually still going on, or maybe it just ended. Uh, it looks like maybe it just ended. So I haven't even seen the whole video yet. I was there and I spoke, and then uh, I watched the vote and I left. And it seems like they did a lot more after that. Uh, Excuse my surroundings if you're looking at my room. I have a bunch of eBay stuff for sale on the desk behind me. And instead of cleaning up, I just threw something over top of it to hide it. So I apologize for that. But other than that, uh, welcome to my basement studio. I am going to play a couple of these people talking just because I don't want to reference things they said without giving them the proper opportunity to talk. These were only three minutes long. Uh, council made not a great decision, in my opinion, to limit everyone to three minutes tonight. However, like I said, their meeting was just ending, and I understand that's, uh, that's pretty hard to deal with when you have a family at home and a lot of these guys have jobs and everything they have to do tomorrow, so... We can't just give everybody unlimited time, unfortunately, although if I were on this council, I would have objected to that. Just because I think when you're making big decisions for the public, you should give them all the opportunity to speak, you know, and I personally never have any problem hearing other people's side. And, you know, sometimes they have good ideas and convince me of things. I'm not as hard-headed as I sometimes come off. So anyway, let's uh, play a couple of these and see what they have to say, and we'll talk about them. We will now open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak for Hopefully that's loud enough you can hear it. It's time. You have three minutes, please. We can call them for <coughs> Kathy Curry? A lot of people in attendance tonight. I didn't count, but the hallway was also I full other than what you can see. <laughs> <laughs> because my speech is probably just under five minutes. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to wing it. Um, I know you're going to pass the ordinance, and that's fine. Um, and I'm not against you doing something. Um, I do host a, a street ministry called Curbside Conversation, where I have spent the last three years trying to get to know my neighbors because I kept seeing it and I just kept trying to figure out what was happening so I have formed relationships with them um, and there's just such a vast vast difference I mean there's no way it's going to be solved with just one thing I understand the ordinance she's right about okay? that and I understand your responsibility I know you can't make us all happy I get that I have seven children I get it um, but I feel like it's one sided. I feel like the steps you've taken to help them isn't enough, okay? I'm fine with banning things. I've been to the encampments. I know how I'm safe. She's right. It is kind of one sided. But we'll talk more about why it's one sided here in a few minutes. If it is, I, I get how people run on property. I understand that. But there's not enough in the ordinance. To me, it's just finger pointing. And I get it. You don't know what to do. You don't want the responsibility to pay for it. Okay. But there are those of us that have worked really, really hard every day. We give up. We pay our, we pay. We don't ask you for anything. We pay to help them, to get them into rehab, to drive them places, to provide things for them. Okay. We're, we're doing a lot. And I feel very discarded as a, a citizen that you, I commend you for starting a, a, a town hall meeting. But, but half of that meeting was taken, which I was very interested in, in the opioid from, from the city manager. So you only left us half the time, and then not everyone really got to speak. And I thought, well, that's okay. I didn't go to that meeting. I'll have to take her word for it. Conversation. 
But the next meeting you took with your panel, very select, behind closed doors, and you excluded us. And that's hurtful to me. Listen, I've lived here my whole life. I live right downtown. I pay a lot of taxes, okay? I've done a lot of things. Maybe I'm not a business owner. Maybe I don't bring in millions of dollars. But you know what? We still spend all our money here. We still do things here. I've raised my kids here. My son's on the fire department. Like, we're, we're, we're Clarksburg. And I feel very dismissed and made fun of and poked fun of that you don't even take time to hear us, that you didn't offer another meeting. And I get that you want action. You know what? Say so don't we. We want action because I am talking to them. I know that we have services in place, okay? But this is like when people put stuff down on paper and it looks great until you go to actually do it. I'm telling you, it's not trickling down, okay? It's not all their fault. It's not all their services' fault, but there are things that aren't working. They're not working. It's not simple to say, okay, go there, and they go there, and it's months to get housing, months to get housing. And then they get in a housing, but they don't have the resources. They don't, they're not trained. They don't have, they're used to living in the moment. They can't even succeed. They're set up for failure. And they're back on the streets again. I wish we had more conversation. I want to talk more. It's very hard to do in three minutes for so much. And when I prepared for five minutes, because that's usually the standard to be cut, it's just so unfair. I get it. I get it, but this is why we were supposed to have more time. More time. Before this guy starts, I mean, she had some very valid points there. I definitely, uh, at least from my perspective, I don't dismiss anything she said. I don't like that she said that uh, she felt like she was being laughed at because I really don't think that's the case. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody did laugh at her. It, it won't be me, though. I'm telling you right now. I take everything she said very valid. Good evening. My name is Eli Baumwell. I'm the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia. I'm here to speak in opposition to the camping ban. Now, I think we're all aware that earlier this year, the Supreme Court opened the door to criminalizing homelessness with the Grants Pass decision. But I want to caution you all that that decision was decided on narrow grounds and that these laws, like the one we're considering here tonight, are still legally suspect. If this law passes, we will be examining it and exploring potential challenges. But I didn't come up here to threaten litigation. I came up here to remind you that while Grants Pass may have suggested that you could, nowhere does it say you should. And you should. Our constitutional rights are based on the idea of personal freedom. And this law, attacks one of the most basic freedoms, the right to merely exist in public spaces. What you are proposing is particularly repugnant when you, you realize you're attacking people who are unable to go anywhere else. I don't like the language he's using, that we're not letting people exist. No. We're not letting people camp. Like, you can't set up your temporary home on our property. Making it illegal for them to exist? It also flies in the face of public policy. You've heard and you're going to hear from experts, advocates, practitioners, who will tell you this will do nothing to alleviate homelessness. That in fact, it will make the problems demonstrably worse. And so, even though this, this feels like a good idea. When you hear experts, people who work with people telling you it's going to make something worse, to continue to vote for it is to choose willful ignorance. There's no other way to frame it. Now, I understand being uncomfortable with visible poverty. I'm uncomfortable with visible poverty. But there is a real problem when your solution to it is just to make it invisible. So again, I'm going to urge you to vote no. Thank you very much.
Good evening, Good council members, members um, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Maylee Henderson. I'm a political science student with a pre-law emphasis at West Virginia University, and I'm here the night before my LSAT to express my strong opposition to this camping ban. To begin, the proposed camping ban is unnecessary. We already have laws in place that address trespassing, littering, and disorderly conduct. Passing this ordinance would be redundant. She's right about that part, but we'll get into why. I feel it's still necessary. Let's let her talk. Serving only as a poorly disguised attempt to penalize unhoused individuals for their circumstances rather than truly maintaining public order. This policy is a clearly targeted form of harassment and the U.S. Supreme Court has dealt with facially neutral policy like this before. In Griggs versus Duke Power Company in 1971, the court unanimously sided with the disenfranchised party and can be quoted saying that policies that have an exclusionary effect can be just as illegal as policies that are intended to exclude. Let me say that one more time. Policies that have an exclusionary effect can be just as illegal as policies that are intended to exclude. This policy is... We're excluding them from camping on public property? This girl is way smarter than me, but that is a, a weak approach to this. I'm sorry. They're informed, but discriminatory, discriminatory, excuse me, in operation, and you do not have adequate defense to your necessity. Criminalizing poverty through tickets and fines adds yet another layer of hardship to people who are already struggling. This ordinance is excessive and ineffective. Finding them and hitting their credit report would only worsen their situation and create lasting records that make reintegration into society, which let's remember is the ultimate goal, extremely difficult. You stated in previous meetings that tickets would be given and the penalized persons would be expected to go to court and then be told to pay the fine or go to jail or to rehab. Just to stop her real quick, that was never said. There is no path to jail included in this ordinance. Morgantown's ordinance has that. This ordinance does not have that. I'm sorry to correct her, but she did not read the ordinance or she did not understand it. Penalized persons would receive a ticket that goes up in money value each time they get ticketed per day and these tickets would reset every day. This aspect of the policy appears to have a concealed intent that could lead to the criminaliz criminalization of homelessness under the guise of public safety. The proposed manner in which citations will be issued is excessive and anyone who has outstanding tickets can be arrested. While the policy... Also, not true. Municipal court does not arrest people for not paying a ticket. I'm not, you know, she's pre-law. I'm sure she's. This is presented as a measure to maintain public order. It carries underlying implications that would disproportionately lead to the incarceration of unhoused individuals. No or incarceration. So any type of medical care against their will is immoral. And being in control of our own autonomy is an American principle. It's also ineffective. D.B. Marlowe et al.'s Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis titled An Effectiveness Trial of Contingency Management in a Felony Pre-Adjudication Drug Court found that there is psychological research that suggests individuals who voluntarily enter rehabilitation or treatment programs often see better outcomes than those who are forced or mandated to participate. Now, while court-mandated treatments can sometimes lead to positive outcomes, individuals who enter treatment voluntarily often show more sustained and long-term progress. I'm sure she's right about that. Concepts of intrinsic motivation and readiness for change, which are key Not the point. in the success of recovery programs. This ordinance will also cost the citizens. Man, your time is up, please. To finish, please. Enforcing and um, implementing jail sentences will divert funds and attention from no real jail. safety and public welfare efforts. The last thing I would like to say is that our police are to be used as a resource to protect and to serve the community. This is and serving. Our taxpayer dollars are not to be used as um, means for the enforcement of fear tactics and the harassment of minorities. Fear groups. tactics? As I said before, I'm sure she's much smarter than me. Very intelligent. She'll probably be standing in front of the Supreme Court one day where I'll never be. But I'm sorry. She either didn't read the ordinance or she just completely didn't understand it because uh, I'm sure the 
health stuff, treatment stuff she's talking about is probably correct. I'm sure she sourced that and looked it up. But the information she gave about the ordinance was just all completely wrong. I'm sorry. I'd like to thank the council once again for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, you already know my opinion, so there's no surprise there. Um, I do want, though, rather than speaking to the face of the ordinance, to speak a little bit about the process of how this proposed amendment got to the floor today. And whether you're for this ban or not, I just want you to ask this question. Put this question on the front of your mind. Is this what an honest, transparent, responsible <coughs> government looks like? So I'm just going to walk you through um, how this ordinance, that I found out about this ordinance. So when I got when there was a camping ordinance, um, I looked all over the city website to find the ordinance. I checked the council website days before the reading. It wasn't there. I finally called the city. I'm going to give this guy credit. He is 100% right here right now. I complained about this the whole time I was on the council. Uh, when I was a member of the council, I used to take the agenda and certain important parts of the agenda and post them on the this page on the Clarksburg News and Observer uh, as soon as they came out so people could see that information in public. I think we do a bad job of posting information. He's right. City clerk, Annette, who was polite and responsive and very helpful and got it to me right away. <laughs> but I shouldn't have to do that. Second, then when I came to the first reading of the proposed camping ordinance, there were no copies of the proposed ordinance for the people who were gathered. So even if there was a public notice, if they can't read the ordinance, what good is that? And only yesterday. Only He's right about that, too. That would be super easy. You got the big TV right up there. Uh, even if you didn't hand out copies, if you didn't want to go to that expense, you could easily, easily put the ordinance up there on the TV while we're talking about it and let people read it. Only yesterday <clears throat> was this ordinance even put on the city council website. So I ask you once again, that question that I put in the forefront of your mind, is this what an honest, transparent, responsible government looks like? If someone wanted to open a homeless shelter, if someone wanted to open a syringe exchange or a recovery house, hypothetically, right, you'd, be, you'd better believe we would have multiple public <laughs> hearings and multiple public notices and multiple public conversations about it because we understand that those things are controversial and those things are polarizing. And clearly, this ordinance is controversial and polarizing. And we've had, what, one public here, one public first reading where it wasn't even read. <laughs> And clearly, this proposed camping ordinance is also controversial and polarizing, and it was rushed through a first reading, and no publicity was made anywhere. So I ask again, is this what honest, transparent, responsible government looks like? It's clear that the city knows how to get the word out about things. We saw ads about the community conversations, about homelessness and addiction everywhere, on social media, on the marquee over at the Robinson Grant, all over Facebook, on the city website. But when actual decisions are being made that affect people's lives, real people's lives, you can't find it anywhere. Strange. People of Clarksburg right. are left in the dark. Now, I don't know if that's your intent. I don't believe that's your intent. I don't judge intents don't and so. motives. I don't believe it was your intent to shut people out of this conversation, but that's what happened. And so I ask you, regardless of whether you support the letter, the letter of the camping ordinance, I want you to think about this process, and I want you to ask the question, is this how you want decisions to be made in your city? Is this the precedent we want to set? We don't communicate with residents. We didn't communicate with residents, businesses, faith leaders, service providers, the very people who you need on board to make this work. Is this what honest government looks like? So let us, so we're here, let me f finish. I'm sorry, um, is that what, what, what was initially done in the dark we are here to bring it to light. You're going to vote however you want to, but we are here to shine the light and let you know that the city of Clarksburg is respectfully paying attention. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what he had to say. Because I want to, I guess, give you a different way of looking at what he said. He's right. To a point. However, I'm going to give this council big props for the same reason he's not. Because it takes a lot of courage to come up with something 
on the agenda that is going to be this unpopular. You know it's going to be unpopular as soon as you put it on there. But you know you're doing what's right for the city. Are there being transparent and honest? I would argue with him and say they're being much more transparent and honest than we've been in the past. And I'll include myself in that. Because <laughs> we've never had a no camping ban. Uh, but there's always been a no camping ban. The difference is they're coming out in public doing the hard work and putting it in writing and sitting up there and defending it. Which, I'm telling you folks, it's not easy. You may think it's easy for them, but it's not easy to go against a room full of people, no matter what the situation is. And the reason I say they're being more transparent and honest than everyone else Every city has a no camping ban, folks. I mean, we're going to get to Will Hyman talking here in a few minutes. Uh, go pitch a tent in Bridgeport. I invite you. See what happens. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it to you. In 2019, when I was elected to council, we were out cleaning up massive, massive camps. The... Encampment problem that we have today is nothing compared to the encampment problem that we had in 2019. We had camps with 20 and 30 people in like five or six different locations in Clarksburg. They were everywhere. It, it's so much different now. I mean, we're fighting small amounts of tents right now. I don't want to say how many because then people are going to be coming back and trying to correct me. But... Usually when there's an encampment, I'm one of the people that gets a phone call <laughs> because the citizens know me as someone who would take care of such a situation and many of them don't know because a lot of them don't pay that much attention. They don't know I'm not on council anymore. So when there's a few tents that pop up in Northview, for example, I hear about it. it. Might be a Facebook message, might be a phone call, might be somebody posting on my group, Clarksburg News and Observer. But I promise you, I hear about it. And the only difference between them putting this ordinance in writing now and what we were doing back when I was on council is I feel like we were giving the people, these people that are gathered in this room, uh, no knowledge of what we were doing. And we were giving the homeless people who pretty much thought that, you know, it was free reign in Clarksburg and you could build a camp wherever you wanted, no warning and sending public works or, you know, groups of councilmen. You may all think that we just sit behind a desk, but I can tell you right now, I've cleaned up some homeless encampments. Uh, with small groups of people and other people that are still sitting on that on that pulpit right now, they have, were out there with me clearing encampments at one time. So I guess we'll get into that more here in a few minutes. I think this is this council being more honest and transparent. Uh, I wanted to pass a ban just like this years ago, but because a you know, favorable Supreme Court decision like the one that just happened wasn't out there. I couldn't get four votes to do it. So I don't know that it ever even made it onto an agenda. I don't think it did. Uh, we did have a no sitting or lying ordinance that's still on the books that you can read that uh, does very similar things that this ordinance does. It's also not criminal, but it gives police the uh, power to under municipal ordinance, tell people they can't sit on the sidewalk, lay on the sidewalk, blah, blah, blah. You'd have to go look it up, but it's out there. We did that instead of this because I couldn't get four people to agree that this would stand up if we were challenged. Let's move on. We'll get back to this.
These last few weeks have been really difficult for people experiencing outdoor homelessness in Clarksburg. The existing places where folks have been camping, as Tiffany mentioned, have been forcibly disbanded on several occasions without notification to service providers or to the people who were living in those encampments. Many of them were, were asked to get their belongings and to leave within five minutes. I want to be clear that this is not a strategy for resolving homelessness. Okay, that's not great. What has occurred as a result is that some of the most vulnerable people within this population, people with chronic illnesses like diabetes, people with serious mental illness, people with cognitive deficits, spent a handful of nights without anything to keep warm. They were preyed on by others within the population and those not within the population who were able to make it back to their sites and stole from them. Violence erupted amongst many who have been robbed on so many occasions and who engaged in this behavior out of complete desperation. And naturally, the strong ones came out okay. And the weak and sick and disabled ones, well, they came out weaker, sicker, and more hamstrung. Life-saving medications like insulin were stolen with entire... Okay, that's not nice to hear. And I know that's part of the reality of this, but... Yeah, we'll get more into that here in a few minutes, but that's not nice to hear. Their backpacks, the only family photos that people have left, their only sleeping bag. We did not resolve their homelessness. We did, however, succeed in intensifying their misery. It was cruel, it was unnecessary, and it was disingenuous in the context of the conversation of this ordinance. I want to also caution folks as to shelter capacity within this region of the state. Our organization places folks into shelter daily. Shelter beds are not limitless. They are a finite resource, and they are quite difficult to access this time of year. We place into shelters throughout the region, Morgantown, Elkins, Charleston, Fairmont. <coughs> when approaching this regionally, even still, it is quite difficult to access shelter beds. There are days where we cannot find shelter beds, even if a person wants to access shelter. I recently asked people experiencing homelessness at our outreach clinic to take the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire. If you're unfamiliar with the ACE study, it's one of the largest studies on the link between childhood maltreatment and abuse and well-being later in life. What we learned from this study, in short, is that the higher your ACE score, the more risk you assume for negative uh, social and health outcomes. The average ACE score in our outreach clinic on Friday, August 16th was 4.7. The most common Experience individuals ascribed to in the questionnaire was having lived with someone who was depressed, mentally ill, or attempted suicide. Additionally, 40% of those surveyed experienced an unwanted sexual contact, contact as a child. There are upstream and downstream solutions to these challenges. To put this in perspective, adults with an A score of four or more are 1,220% more likely to attempt suicide. They are 1,003% more, more likely to inject drugs. 460% more likely to have recent depression. Sadly, most of this happened right here in Harrison County. I know that's a difficult, a, a difficult piece to own. There are evidence-based solutions to these problems, and this is not one of them. All of us here are here to work with you. We're ready to do the hard work. We're already doing it. We need to have more conversation about this. Marissa, I don't doubt anything Marissa says. I really, really like her and I highly respect her. And I think she is very dedicated to this cause. And I think she can solve a lot of problems. She's a very, she's a very powerful woman. However, the stuff that she's getting into there, I feel like is, you know, we have like the game, the sport, the league, and then like the planet. And we're down here. And I understand, you know, she's, I don't know what her actual degree or qualifications are, but she's obviously very smart. And she's looking at this much deeper than uh, a dumb politician like me, probably. But the city's perspective is down here at the game level. 
we're not up here. Um, there's probably a better way to explain that, but it's just a little off track to the actual subject, if you ask me. But I'm sure it's 100% accurate. Uh, I talked about how we started tearing down homeless camps immediately uh, when my council was elected in 2019. Marissa was actually a big part of that. Of course, she didn't like it, uh, but we let her be involved. Uh, she was really one of the leaders. Um, she was paired with interim police chief at the time, Jason Snyder, and they were going in and talking to these people before... I don't know how far before we were going in and cleaning up the encampment. I can't remember if it was the same day or the day before, which we can get into that more here in a minute. But we were trying really hard to be nice about it and to help them and to get their stuff out of there, not destroy or throw away all their stuff. Um, what we found when we started doing it was, no offense to them, but it was mostly trash anyway, including they. They didn't even want most of the stuff. Anything that was important to them, in most cases, they had on them. But I don't want to get into that argument. I'm sure it's different for every homeless person. Uh, what they left there when they weren't there was, um, for the most part, folks, a disgusting mess that was just the, the most terrible thing in the world to clean up for our public works department and anybody else that was out there helping. Um uh, but I respect anything Marissa has to say, though. Uh, I would, you know, more than encourage the city to help Marissa in any way they can and give her more resources. I believe she's through the United Way. But she's definitely effective, and she's definitely one of the best resources out there. I live over in Golf Plaza. Uh, my husband and I are three dogs and our two little boys. Um, those of you who have seen my guys running around uh, first Fridays or when we had our mommy and me baking business, uh, especially Bowen. But um, so here tonight, talking about this. Um, so um, I am a former school teacher. Um, a lot of uh, you know, trauma, the you know, things that a lot of my students would go through. Uh, it has a lot to do with, you know, their family members, their parents, their grandparents, aunts, uncles. And, you know, that generational trauma, you're know, just coming down, you know, towards them. And so <coughs> when I look at uh, what, you know, this ordinance has included in it, um, the verbiage of, you know, uh, paying like so much you know per day and it's people that already don't have anything and you know I understand that it can be up to um, I think that's something that that verbiage definitely would need to be worked on um, and you know I know that police officers are already you know working with them and you know with that um, I think that having maybe more social workers involved would be a big help and uh, you know do what you can to get that I know that costs money but I think, uh, you know, field training, you know, having, you know, you know, social workers involved in that, I think uh, would be a great or Andy from the socio or psych field with that. Um, from what I understand, there is a women's shelter that uh, may be opening soon. Um, I'd like to hear more numbers about that. Um, you know, uh, you know, how many of the homeless do we have are female? Um, how many spaces would actually be available to them? Um, you know, what about uh, there being a possibility for a men's shelter or emergency shelter, family shelter? You know, it can't just be one group that is serviced. And then, um, you know, last of all with this is, you know, why not have a task force for this? Why don't we have people in the community? I mean, we definitely have people that are interested in wanting to speak and that they want to do good. She's right. If people are willing to help you, you don't turn it down. Uh, it's hard to get people to do anything today. It's really difficult to get people involved. So if people want to be involved, 
you're really stupid not to let him be involved. You know, I grew up here. Um, my maiden name is Jet. <clears throat> so, you know, my, my dad's refereed almost my whole life. My uncle's a coach. Great guy. Uh, my, my aunt's a nurse. My mom's worked just about everything around here. My great-grandmother was a chef at Julio's and Menard's. You know, I have very firm roots here. My little boy came in third for the pasta cook-off this year. He's very proud of that. But <laughs> he will be happy to hear this. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is where I grew up. This is where I have brought my boys. I, I lived for 13 years in Fairmont. I brought my boys here to live and be around my family. You will see us constantly walking through town, you know, going to the Bluebird. I want, I want them to grow up in a positive, wonderful place. And I think that we need to have more conversation about what we can do to make that better. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Jenny Williams. What was that again? Reverend Jenny Williams. Oh. Hi, I'm Reverend Jenny Williams. I'm the faith organizer for the ACLU of West Virginia, and I'm the director of the West Virginia Faith Leaders Network. Like others, I'm concerned that the process for bringing this ordinance is disjointed and not transparent. The involvement of the public, which includes faith communities and service providers, apparently be- Okay, when I hear ACLU, I get a little annoyed right off the bat. I'm trying not to be that. These all seem like really nice people, but uh, this has already been to the Supreme Court. I feel like we are doing the ultralight version of it when they've already approved a heavy-handed version of it. Maybe they should go look at Morgantown's ordinance. It's a lot more heavy-handed than this one. Wasting your time in Clarksburg. ...began with a community conversation, and then months later, with no more public conversation or work, this ordinance showed up on the City Council agenda of October 18 with no way of citizens seeing it without contacting the city offices to obtain a copy. If you take the utilitarian approach to this matter and you see unhoused people as a problem, you're gonna need faith communities to help you address the problem. If you take the moral approach to this matter and you see unhoused people as people, whose basic human needs aren't being met, you still need faith communities to help you address their needs. This ordinance manufactures a crisis. I'm gonna actually back her up on this because we'll get into what I think about the responsibilities of the city versus the responsibility of other organizations, but by a simple search, actually using chat GTP, there are over 100 churches in Harrison County that have a, you know, Harrison County address. Over 100 churches. How many have a shelter for the homeless that they're so worried about? One. Over 100, one shelter. And these people are all mad at the city. This and alienates the very partners you need to achieve the outcome you want, which is for people to stop sleeping on public property. If that's your ultimate goal, that's your prerogative. I would hope that your ultimate goal would be helping people find a place to sleep without the involvement of law enforcement. The ordinance mentions, mentions offering shelter to folks who are sleeping in public. Without a continuous emergency shelter in place, I don't know what shelter you plan to offer them, but your transportation plan had better be robust and able to be enacted immediately. I highly, highly, highly agree with her on this point. And I propose that the city council considers making a deal with Centra where the city funds a maybe bi-weekly transportation program that goes from downtown Clarksburg to the shelter in Fairmont and then to the shelter in Morgantown and returns to Clarksburg. Wouldn't cost that much in gas. Wouldn't take that much time. If you did it two or three times a week, I think that wouldn't be enough. 
you'd probably still end up running a police officer to one of those shelters once in a while. But let's be honest, folks. Clarksburg is 15 miles from Fairmont, 30 miles from Morgantown. I mean, have any of you ever lived in a real city? I've lived 10 years in Raleigh, North Carolina, the Raleigh-Durham area. To my knowledge, there were maybe three emergency shelters. I haven't looked this up or anything, so don't go Google it and fact check me. But I just want you to understand how big the Research Triangle Parkway Raleigh-Durham is. I mean, (laughs) it is such a huge area with millions, maybe I shouldn't say millions, maybe it's not millions, I don't know what the actual population is, I'm just talking, but the Research Triangle Parkway, to think that you would say, oh, well, there's no way we can get the homeless to this shelter that's 30 miles away. What? I would drive 30 miles to go to Bojangles. (laughs) I mean... In our rural area, we just have a little bit of a different attitude of how far away something is. Fairmont's 15 miles away. 15 miles. The way I drive, it's like a 12-minute drive. (laughs) Anyway. When I lived in Mon County, the shelter in Morgantown was moved two miles out of downtown. And it took an army of volunteers, which I coordinated, to offer rides to unsheltered people from downtown to the shelter every night in their personal vehicles so that people who didn't have a place to sleep did not need to walk in excess of 40 minutes one way, literally uphill and in the snow to secure. She's right. We can't expect them to walk to either of the shelters I mentioned. It's going to involve the police giving them a ride in most cases or the city having some kind of deal with one of the cab companies or Centra, or like I mentioned, we're going to have to have some kind of transportation plan. I agree on this one. I don't think that was a reason not to vote for the ordinance tonight, but this woman is right. Pure a place to sleep. The planning and the execution of that volunteer program was significant. Without a continuous emergency shelter in place, you're already making people sleep outside, subject to the elements. And this ordinance would be penalizing them for doing so, which is just cruel. Councillor Jackson was cited in a news story as saying that this ordinance presents, quote, an opportunity to start to work together. This seems backward to me. Why would you issue a prohibitive ordinance based on an offer of services that aren't plentiful or don't exist with the penalties of citations and fines for not accepting the offer of non-existent services? Just real quick to throw in there. There is a fine associated with this. However, the fine will immediately be dropped if they agree to treatment or seek shelter. Not very many ordinances on the books like that. Let me say that again in case you didn't get it. The fine will immediately be dropped if they have made an effort to seek treatment or shelter. It doesn't, the way I read it, it doesn't even necessarily say that they can't, they're going to have to pay the fine, I'm sorry, they're going to have to pay the fine if they don't get shelter says they will not be fined if they seek shelter. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure when I read it, that was one of my takeaways from it. And hopefully I wasn't reading an old version or something. I don't know. Like I said, I'm going to back up one of the other speakers and say I don't actually have it right here in front of me in writing. So maybe I'll try to find it before we end this video. And then begin to work to find solutions. This is completely illogical. I encourage you to vote no on this ordinance. Good evening. I'm sure most of you know my name by now. Um, I'm Kevin Brand. I'm one of the founders and organizers for Friends Feeding Friends Community Outreach, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I stand before you to express my concern about the proposed camping ban and the devastating impact that it would have on the homeless population in our community. 
I believe your camping ban is doing an injustice to those that are unhoused and struggling with homelessness in our community. It is not offering any real help or alternative to the situation. First, let's clear this up, that homelessness is not a choice for everybody. In some cases it could be, but that's not for everybody. Sometimes it's a consequence of systemic failures from the shortage of affordable housing, mental health challenges, addiction, and economic disparities. Our homeless neighbors are people who are struggling to survive, sometimes at no fault of their own. Passing this ban will only further these hardships for them. Banning camping in the city does not solve the root cause of homelessness. It merely forces vulnerable people out of sight and out of mind, which I think is what you want. Further, this criminalizes their existence and displaces them without offering any real solutions or alternative options. By removing the homeless camps in our community, we are not addressing their need for shelter, health care, or supportive services. Instead, with this camping ban, we are pushing them into dangerous and isolated environments. We have been told by some city council members sitting here tonight that there are tons of resources available, but whenever that's asked for, it's never available for us. Even if there are all these resources available, what's your plan for when this ordinance goes into effect for the waiting period to get housing for a person? Because that can take sometimes months. With this camping ban, Clarksburg City Government is choosing to criminalize survival instead of working to ensure homelessness will have the resources to rebuild their lives how they need. Rather than working on passing this ban, why don't we focus on efforts and expanding services and getting people to these services, such as shelters, mental health care facilities, affordable housing, job training, and addiction treatment. We need to provide safe, stable options for people to transition out of homelessness. You need to listen to the homelessness community and the local organizations that serve daily or weekly who know that the camping ban is not going to solve the homelessness in our city. Imagine what our community would be if we took the time and energy that we put into enforcement and turned it into compassion and long-term solutions. Imagine what our city might look like where shelters, mental health treatment, and addiction treatments are easily accessible and where people who are homeless are treated with dignity and respect. That is the kind of city we could build, but only if we choose to invest our solutions that prioritize people over punishment. We can build this type of city if the city government will work with groups and organizations and give the support that we all need. I urge you to vote against this camping ban. Let us not create more barriers for people who are already facing the impossible odds and work together to get them the help they need. Mr. Brand, your time's up. All right, well, to that, I would say stop using your position to look down on people in the community. I would say stop accusing others for causing these issues in your community come out from behind that desk and make a difference. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Uh, well, I met Kevin for the first time tonight. I feel like we've uh, had an adversarial type of relationship online. Completely invented. I mean, I can be a little brash online, obviously, sometimes. And... From our conversations, he can too. Maybe he's just a little bit more, uh, I don't know, condescending than uh, I am, which I am too. So I'm not going to say anything that Kevin said there was wrong, but I'm going to challenge what he says a little bit because I think a lot like Marissa, he's very smart and he's probably right about everything he's saying. However, once again, I feel like we're at the 500 foot level here and Kevin is at the 50,000 foot level here. Would it be great if we could, you know, cure homelessness here in Clarksburg, West Virginia? That would be spectacular. Uh, like Kevin was saying, you know, we could provide health care, addiction resources, you know, we could end addiction here too. sounds really really good folks it's just not realistic i'm sorry it's not realistic if you're a city like seattle or san francisco or houston texas or miami it's not realistic when you have billions of dollars of budget we have an 18 million dollar budget million 18 million dollar budget here in clarksburg 75 percent of that 
when I was on council, was going to pay the employees. That's, you know, public works, the fire department, the police department, the finance department, everybody that works uh, in the city building. That's 75% of our income. So that little piece that's left, we're going to fix all the world's problems with. It's, it's just not realistic, folks. Uh, it's like, this always becomes an issue that I end up talking about around city council elections. When people come out and run for city council and start talking that stuff, it annoys the hell out of me because they just don't understand what they're about to get into. And some of those people are on this council right now. You find out when you get up there, there's no money. Like, there's no money. You want to cure homelessness and addiction? Give people health care? With 25% of $18 million. Now remember, you got to pave the streets. Uh, we're not responsible for the water because the water board's their own thing, but you got to run the sewers. You have any idea how much maintenance... Public Works does? Parks and Rec? This is all out of 25% of that $18 million. And actually, it's probably more than that now. Since I haven't been on council, they've given some pretty significant raises to, like, the police department. That's why we're actually able to staff it for the first time ever. I don't know that it's ever been fully staffed until now. Thank God for Mark Kitty. Uh, in the city manager, but first time ever that I know of since I've been paid. I got really involved in Clarksburg politics in 2013, and we've never had a fully staffed police department. Never. That's not an exaggeration. Never. It's been down as low as 23 officers. Uh, I don't know what the budget is actually right now. I don't know if it's still... I think it was 46. Uh... It was supposed to be 50, but at that time they lowered it to make the budget look better to 46, which made me furious. It really is supposed to be 50. We should have 50 police officers. So I don't know when they say we're fully staffed. I don't know if that just is getting us to 45 or 46. Uh, they got some kind of grant where two guys are paid for. So maybe that's 48. I don't know. We'll have to check into that. But anyway, let's move on here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Linda Muley. I've been the pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran Church for the past 16 years on Milford Street, and I live here downtown. Um, again, I would like to speak to the process. I was part of the community conversation in August, and it was my understanding that that conversation was going to continue. Um, in my own congregation, um, the, the congregation is very committed to the needs of the community. Um, I have six members who Open a volunteer shelter. every week at the Mustard Seed and have direct interface. <clears throat> you know, many of the unsheltered uh, folks in our neighborhood by name and know of their varied situations. Um, to me, these are the kinds of folks that need to be invited into the conversation, not just the unsheltered folks, but the folks who are working with them on a committed weekly basis, giving of their time and their energy. In addition, St. Mark's Church over um, the time that I have been there has given literally tens of thousands of dollars to various organizations in the county that provide um, assistance to folks on the verge of eviction, as well as to food to provide for folks who have, are hungry and various other sorts of things. <coughs> as has been already stated, the faith communities have been engaged with this problem, are committed to working with folks um, to creative solutions. I would suggest two things. One is, and this is a very simple thing in my mind, because I understand personal people who have personal property downtown and the concerns that the unsheltered folks uh, present. My understanding is that the Jackson Square facility was built with taxpayer dollars. There are bathrooms in that facility that are locked all the time unless you rent that space. 
you could easily create a couple of jobs, as they do in Europe and in many other areas, where you have a paid staff person to monitor those bathrooms, and those bathrooms become public access, not just for unsheltered. To be clear, my opinion on something like this, number one, they would destroy those bathrooms and we'd have to replace them within two years or less. Number two, when you start giving benefits like that, when you start giving amenities, you grow the homeless population. I know some people won't like that I said that, but it's true. I'm sorry. Other people, but in the comments if like you disagree. Me, who maybe want to shop downtown, but might need to use a restroom. <clears throat> a restroom that was built with my tax dollars. This would provide resource for those Most businesses who are on the street. provide a restroom. It would eliminate unsanitary practices occurring in other areas. And it's a simple city thing. building is also open to the public Again, and has restrooms. There are creative ways to address this problem, and that's where we need each other to think creatively. I visited a restaurant in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, several years ago. The back of it was a homeless shelter, the front of it, where I ate, was a full restaurant. I and wouldn't eat there. What they did was, as people in the shelter had an opportunity to be safe and heal and receive the services they needed. They then were transitioned to learn skills in the restaurant. They the city labor. provided, you know, a trained chef to teach people cooking skills, weight staff that? skills and other types of things. I'm not They're sure I believe that. Creative ways forward, but a I'm gonna have to look that one up. is not one of them. Thank you. myself because we don't have a timer um, but three minutes here we go thank you all for letting me speak this week uh, I spoke last week which was not supposed to happen but we were posed some questions and I felt the need to answer already things have been said that I wanted to say in terms of the redundancy of this we punish crimes in this country we don't punish existence if you are trespassing they are punished under trespassing ordinances things that already exist in this county we'll get into People that more steal they're treated as thieves and they're punished for that that is already taken care of this is an ordinance that when speaking to city council members after the meeting, I was told changes nothing. And if true. that is true, it, does it change seems nothing. strange to me that it needs to be pushed forward in the silence, in the solitude, like we've I'll already said that. it has been. Now, when I moved here four years ago, that's right, I'm a transplant. I haven't been here my whole life. But when I moved here four years ago, I was hopeful as I worked with churches, as I worked with community organizations, that this city would be supportive of what we do. But you know, I've never heard, I don't think anything from the city council, anything but hushed whispers of opposition. To the point that when I was doing a Bible study about a year ago, I had a parishioner of mine said, I was at a breakfast at the FOP and I am so mad because a city council member was there and said that they wanted to eliminate homelessness and get rid of that winter shelter that First Church does because it's an unorganized mess. Well, my parishioner volunteered at that shelter and she let them know exactly how it's run. Let them know exactly what good it does. And I had hope when I came here last month that maybe the shelter was in higher esteem because when they were talking about the need to get people into shelter after they're kicked out of camps, the sh Hey, you know what? Just a quick uh, side note to what he's saying. I just want to make it very, very clear. He ain't talking about me. <laughs> when he was saying that, I was sitting in the back of the room uh, back behind him to the right. And I feel like at least three people in the room looked at me when he said that. I want to make very, very clear. I never had that interaction with anyone at the FOP. That wasn't me. <laughs> Shelter was brought up, but not one person on the council could name when it opened. Something that takes a Google search to tell you it's in December. And if you had talked to Mike, who was here that night, he could have told you the exact day in December it opened. Not the city's responsibility. This is a rushed ordinance. It's something that doesn't cling to any clear solutions. I asked uh, Chief Kitty what resources he connects people to, people experiencing homelessness. He said the Chains Initiative. He said Central, Ken Central West Virginia Community Action. And he said that he talks to Marissa, who came here today to speak against this. 
You say you want communication. You say you want collaboration. You rent out the Robinson Grand. Do it all you want until you actually invite people to conversation. Don't post on your website and call that enough. Invite people to have conversations about this, and you will see change happen. We want to work with you. We don't want to be adversarial, as fun as it can be. I'm kidding. But it kidding. is something that we need to He's work right. beyond. I have about 10 seconds here, so I will say this. God cares about how we treat people in need, deeply cares about it. And you have people who want to help you meet people's needs. Please let us. Thank you. Once again, I am going to back him up on that. If these people want to help, the city's stupid if they don't figure out a way to involve them. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not passing the ordinance, to be clear. But we all want to solve the problem. We just have a different view of how to get there. We shouldn't ever turn down help from these people. I am also a transplant in West Virginia. I came here from the city of Detroit seeking a better life 10,037 days ago. I have now found that better life here in Clarksburg. And it hasn't been easy, and it wasn't quick, and it, I can sit here and say there's maybe one, maybe two members on this board who actually remember me from back then. I worked my butt off to better my life. Was it easy? Was it quick? No. Was it solved overnight? No. Will I feed you if you knock on my door? Damn right I will. Will I let you take a shower? Damn right I will. Will I let you spend the night in my house? And I have I let you some of these people spend the night in my house? I have. Not me. But I will also tell you this. I have had my ass beat. I've been degraded and trying to help. So there's not an easy solution. There's not a quick fix. But we're not going to vote making it criminalized to not have a roof over your head. Not criminalized. Because I know, I know I, my house is one Again, misunderstanding. from not having a roof over my head. One blown up hot water tank from not having a roof over my head. My husband just had heart, open heart surgery. If he wouldn't have made it through surgery, I don't know if I would have been standing here today or would I have sought the shelter back in a drug in a drug neighborhood. Because but it's some of the people in this audience that gives me the courage and the understanding because they go out every day and fight to make Clarksburg better. They just don't sit back there and vote. That's all I gotta say. I take no issue with anything she said. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, esteemed members of the council, clerk and manager, uh, I'll try not to, I'll try to take as little time as I can as we can tell a lot of people want to speak. I rose up when you guys had the first reading and I'm back here to ask you again to please reconsider your position on this bill or on this ordinance. Um, I, I don't think any of you are doing what you're doing out of a negative or, or a harmful position and you believe that what you're doing is the right thing. Um, I would just ask you to consider the idea that you don't do anything, you know, you don't work on your car unless you talk to an expert or something like that. And most of the experts on this issue have been in this room, have stood up in front of you and they've spoke and, and they've made it pretty clear that this is probably not the best route to take. Like I mentioned before, when we were at the Robinson Grand and, and now I don't, I, I don't feel anybody in the public that I've interacted with and the people who to me are most invested in working with you know, this vulnerable community of people um, feel like this is the best route to go down or best thing to do at this point in time. And the, the, the biggest thing is, is especially, it's, it's November 7th, guys. I, I, I really, please keep that in mind. 
to, to enact this ordinance at this point in time puts a lot of vulnerable folks out in the cold, literally, and, and that scares me. I don't want to interrupt Mr. Scott. I have no problem with what he's saying here, but I do want to point out that that's a little bit of gaslighting because this ordinance is the opposite of that. You're not making anyone homeless. You're not, you know, evicting them from a nice residence and putting them out on the street and telling them they can't pitch a tent. You're going to them in the tent and telling them they must go to a shelter. So the time of year is not relevant. You're not making them homeless. And I understand that, I, I truly understand that, uh, that you believe what you're doing may be for the right, the most right and good purposes. And I, I appreciate that. him saying that. And, and I'm sure that there's a lot of nuance to this issue that, that, that causes you to, to take the position you have. But ultimately, overall, I just, when you think about it in your heart, it's, this can't be the best route to take. It just can't. There's, there's got to be a better way, and, and the people are in this room that want to work on that and want to do that. So I ask you, please, reconsider your position or table this for another time. This just is not the right time to do this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jessica Scott? I have no issue with anything Mr. Scott said other than just making that point that we're not making them homeless. So. The time of year that we do it is really irrelevant, but other than that, I had no problem with anything he said. Um, I've spoken before you all before, uh, once at this forum, once at that um, seemingly duplicitous meeting um, that you called at the Robinson Grand because um, you seemed to call all of the people into the room to ask for solutions. Folks gave you solutions, and then you did this. Um, so I, I don't have the energy to try to persuade anybody about anything. Um, but I'm from the city. I grew up here. I was educated in Clarksburg Public Schools. Um, I work at First United Methodist Church. I'm there every Friday also feeding folks um, and uh, interacting with folks. I know a lot of people who will be affected by this ban, people who sleep on the streets. Um, their lives are not easy. You're making it harder. Um, as the, one of the young people before me who spoke said, this is redundant. You bragged at the beginning of this meeting about how many encampments you have closed down. So um, it is already not legal to sleep on the streets in Clarksburg. Uh, you are, you know, proposing a fine that these people cannot pay, uh, and then you are suggesting a criminal record that will then bar them from housing. So if you really wanted to solve heart homelessness. I think I mentioned this before already, but this is a municipal ordinance. There's no track for it to make it onto a criminal record. Uh, for a period of time, not forever, it would bar them from the assistance that they could get. Um, if you really wanted to solve homelessness, you would put resources into helping people be housed. Uh, there are several folks in this room who work every single day to house people. Um, this, I really just drove here from Elkins, where I live, to say on the record that this ban is cruel. Uh, it is just absolutely cruel, and that's what I came here to say. I'm only going to say in response to that, it's only cruel if you misunderstand it. I think all these people mean well, so I don't want to say anything bad about anything any of them say. I really think they all mean well. Good evening, everyone. Or I would say it's a good evening, but the fact that we have to be here speaking out against something that criminalizes people simply for being doesn't is criminalize the only solace i can find in this evening is the abundance of community members here with me speaking out against this this ordinance even being thought of shows me that this city is not concerned about solutions the solution orientation is not there there is only a want for a quick fix no matter who it hurts there is a lack of want for positive change 
in the people who are able to make change in this city. There is a lack of empathy for our neighbors. There is a lack of care for our neighbors from many who are more than able to provide it. This ordinance is actively neglecting the actual issues in our community, such as helping lift people out of poverty and homelessness. And to honor God in prayer at the beginning of this meeting, and then still fix your mouths and minds to actively go against the teachings of God, it is hypocritical at best, wicked in reality. Matthew 25 says, in Jesus' words, those who will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven are those who have clothed the naked, fed the hungry and the thirsty, invited in the stranger and cared for the ill, and this ordinance is in direct contradiction to the words of the Lord. Furthermore, I would like to ask, how many of you have actually volunteered or worked with the homeless in any way? Have you actually sat down and spoken to these people like the humans they are and deserve to be treated? Because I do, I have, every Friday, I am at the First United Methodist Church helping feed, clothe, provide showers, and provide community for the unhoused and the impoverished people of this city. If you truly cared about ending homelessness, you would be there with us. We're helping in a, your own way. But this ordinance is more concerned with shoving unhoused people out of your view so you don't feel the need to help them. I implore you to focus more on implementing ways this city can feed the hungry and thirsty, close the naked, and invite in and care for the stranger, rather than send them away because wealthy people in this community see them as a problem. Man, your time is up, please. Thank you. I'm not even going to get into that one. Uh, but I will say, this is where the adversarial nature towards the First United Methodist Church comes from. That's more the attitude that city council members have heard, not the super jolly nice attitude that the other speaker had. Did you want to speak on the ordinance itself? Me? No. Uh, Kathy Curry? That's me. Okay, you, okay, did you want to speak on the ordinance? Are you ready to And Gary Keith. All right, come on down. <laughs> wow, I feel lonely here. All these people, and I guess I'm the only one speaking in support of this ordinance. I don't even know if I should play my own video. It's kind of useless because I'm about to talk. So let's just stop there. This is getting too long anyway. We're over an hour. Uh, the three minute thing sucked. In my opinion, it sucked. Uh, make myself a little bigger there since I'm done with that. Bad idea. I could have talked for 10 minutes. And I think some of the things that I was planning to say could have really helped this ordinance go over a little easier. Probably wouldn't have made people happy with it, but I don't know. Anyway, instead of listening to me talk, let's just uh, move on to the video part where I speak to my opinion on this. One thing, you know, I have a pretty big reach on social media because I've created this Clarksburg News and Observer. It has uh, almost 8,000 members at this point, I think. I'm not looking at it right now, but off the top of my head, I think it's almost 8,000. So I'd like to invite any of the people that spoke today at this meeting. And I think there were actually a few after me, uh, but this, like I said, it's getting too long. Um... I'll invite any of them to, you know, 
maybe we'll do like an interview. I'd be up for that. Uh, I would uh, promise to be very respectful and, you know, not beat down your opinions, but we could have a conversation and do it as like a Zoom meeting and put it up here for people to view. I mean, the ordinance is passed now, so maybe the excitement about it is over. But if any of the people that spoke here tonight or any of the people who didn't have a chance to speak here tonight would like to do a Zoom call or something similar with me and we can put our conversation out there for the public, discuss it. I'd be up for that. Anyway, getting on to my thing. I'm not going to read the whole speech I had prepared. Uh, it would have never even fit in five minutes, so that was unrealistic. But when we got it down to three minutes, I really didn't say anything that I intended to say. Uh, but just to get into without going and doing a speech here. I'm better at just talking to the camera, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm not looking at the camera. I have a really big monitor, and my camera is up here. I have like a 30 inch computer monitor, so I'm more looking at the monitor than I am at the camera, but I apologize for that. Uh, don't feel like I don't have eyes, I do. But um, I'll kind of go into my speech a little bit here. Uh, but the camping ban, I mean, it is a very complicated issue. It's not simple. And I'm not uh, a nasty, cold person who just says, you know, run them all off. You know, I don't care where they go. But the city responsibility in the situation is where I think I have the biggest disagreement with most of these people what you expect out of the city. And what I'd said in the meeting was, you know, there's five things. i to figure out where my hand is on the camera here. There's five things that I believe the city's responsible for. They are infrastructure, including water, sewer, roads, public works. Number two, public safety, police and fire department. Number three, public health, trash collection, health standards, Zoning ordinances. Um, I'm sorry. That's not what I meant. Code enforcement. Which kind of goes into public safety also. Public safety spills over into that also. I don't know where code enforcement actually fits. It's the Homeowners Association. Number four. Zoning. Land use. You know, making sure residential, commercial, and industrial zones are in the right place in the city for the city to be successful and if homelessness falls into anything it kind of falls into land use but we'll get more into that number five parks and rec those are the five things if you ask me now you take those five things and you ball them up into one what is the city council of Clarksburg responsible for my opinion it's those five things balled up into one thing that one thing is making people want to live here you know not just people living here because it's their only option but making people want to live here and that goes into our land value the value of real estate which is something that I'm always very focused on being a real estate agent. The other thing is business. There's a lot of misunderstanding in the public in what funds the city. It's almost all B&O taxes. The businesses fund the city. We are like an incorporated business funded by the businesses. There's other sources that some of the money come from, but it's mostly B&O tax. So, you should really think about that when you insult your local police officer and say, I pay your salary. Because if you don't own a business, okay, <laughs> we won't get into that. But, anyway... 
those are the core things that the city is responsible for. So the argument that a lot of these people want to make is how can the city regulate something without giving a solution to the problem? What? Folks, that's what we do. <laughs> we are the government. <laughs> uh, let's just talk about some examples. We regulate smoking. We ain't going to help you quit. We also ain't going to buy your cigarettes. But we're going to tell you when and where you can smoke. What else? We're going to tell you, you know, you can't have outside cats. We're not going to go trap them and we're not going to help you get them fixed. We're just going to tell you you can't have them. If they exist, we're going to encourage other people to trap them. We're not going to do it. We regulate when and where you can sell alcohol. We're not going to help you get over your alcoholism. We tell you when and where you can gamble. We're not going to tell you it's a bad investment. That's your decision. We have loitering ordinances. How does a loitering ordinance work? It's mostly about business. You can stand wherever you want. You just can't stand right here, pretty much. Uh, we can make you move. Somebody in the crowd there bought up needle exchanges. We used to have a needle exchange in Clarksburg. I was very, very instrumental in closing that down. And everyone said, oh, you can't close that down. We have to provide them drug treatment. We have to have more treatment beds at Highland Hospital. We have to provide them clean needles. We should even be providing them a safe space to inject their drugs. If you get rid of this needle exchange, it's going to be a, uh, what do they call it? Like a health disaster in downtown Clarksburg. It'll have the opposite negative effect that you think it'll have, Gary Keith. Eh. Proven wrong. We haven't had any huge outbreak. We're not overrun by zombies like they tried to say we would be. It was false. The greatest thing that happened to this city. Well, no, I'll take that back. The second greatest thing that happened to this city in recent history was ending that needle exchange. Again, other things. We're not going to let you park your car in your yard if it breaks down. But we're also not going to get you a mechanic. You can't park your RV or boat on the street. We're not going to loan you one of our garages over at Public Works. We're not going to let you stack up trash in your yard. But we're also not going to pay your trash bill. We're not going to let you live in a house without plumbing, without water and sewer. But we're not going to provide you that for free. That's your responsibility. So this council has suggested a camping ban without providing an emergency shelter. Oh my, how dare them. That's what we do. We don't have the resources, folks. We would love to provide all these things. We would love to provide these things and more. We would be beloved. Everyone would love us. But you know what? It wouldn't solve the problem. If you housed, if you gave, let's say you had 20 real homeless people that really had no other option and couldn't get through any of these other services. Let's say you gave them 20 houses. You know what you'd have then? 40 homeless people. If you gave them 40 houses, then you'd have 80. And so on and so forth. Ask Seattle. They already tried this. <laughs> you can't cure homelessness. When you start trying to cure it, you multiply it. Like, you're just going to make things worse. And that's just a fact of the matter. I'm sorry. You know... So, can we provide emergency shelter? 
we talked about with the other lady that spoke. I, I can't remember people's names. I apologize. I should have taken notes as they were talking just now. Uh, she was 100% right, though. We do have to come up with some way to transport these people. Uh, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel and create another shelter. You know, 15 miles away in Morgantown, 30 miles away in... I'm sorry, 30 miles away in Morgantown, 15 miles away in Fairmont. And then somebody also said there's one in Elkins. Also one in Charleston. Still only an hour away, or I'm sorry, hour, what, 35, 40 minutes? I don't know, two hours away, we'll just say. That is not an unreasonable distance. Maybe Charleston is right on the edge of unreasonable. There's also a shelter in Parkersburg. I think it's only 50 miles away too. But we pretend as if we have to have every service in the city of Clarksburg. What? We're poor, folks. Maybe when Clarksburg was a city of 50,000, that might have been true. We're 14-some thousand people. Like I told you before, we have an $18 million budget, 75% of which is going to employ salaries. I mean, it's fire and police is a huge part of it. It's just not realistic. We don't have the resources. It's just not there. You can't squeeze blood out of a stone. It's not that the city doesn't want to help. It's that it's just completely out of the realm of realism. I mean, there's no way. There just isn't. 14,000 people, folks. And like I told you, Chet GPT told me, there are over a hundred locations in Harrison County that are churches. Over a hundred churches? And you want the city of Clarksburg to be responsible for housing the homeless? What about the city of Bridgeport? What is the difference in median income? They're the ones that have all the money. They're the ones in 10 and 15 and 20 million dollar churches over there. How are we, the city of Clarksburg, responsible for the problem? I just don't see how that could make sense to anyone. And once again, it's not that we don't care about the problem. It's just that y'all aren't being realistic. I'm sorry. You know, so my second point really was, I've already made it, that there are some services and, you know, we want there to be more services. I think if the opioid money could help provide more services, that's spectacular. But the opioid money, it's not that much either. I mean, I think Tiffany Fell is doing a spectacular job of trying to slow drift that money and making sure that it doesn't all disappear at once and then we have no idea where it went because I've been guilty of being on councils where things like that happened. Uh, it's like we thought we had this huge, huge amount of money, and you find out very quickly when you're in government that one-time money, like the COVID money that came in, you know, Biden bucks, as a lot of people called it, it looked like it was going to be a lot of money, but man... It sounds like a lot of money when you hear the numbers, when you hear millions and millions of dollars. But when you start spending on a city level, one-time money just goes so fast. And it's like people come up to you and say, what happened to that money? Well, it's like you can go on gov.com and see how every penny of that money was spent. But for me to actually point to things and say, and right there, that's what we did with that money. It's sketchy, folks. So I think Tiffany's taken the right approach to mistakes that she's seen in the past. And I was part of those mistakes. So I'll take some responsibility for that. That COVID money, it was just like dust in the wind, man. Seemed like a ton of money. And the fire department needed some money. And then we need an excavator. We need the, you know... Two giant upgrades at the sewer department. And, man, you know, 
that money was gone so fast. And part of it filled some shortfalls in the budget from B&O taxes that weren't made when, you know, lockdowns were going on. That money, it was gone so fast. And like the one or two good things that we did try to do with it turned to complete crap. Like they were the worst small amounts of that money that we spent. Of all the money, they were the worst things. So uh, the things that we had the best intentions for, some of those turned out to be the worst things. So good for Tiffany. Take your time. Find good things to spend that money on along with the council. Uh, bring every everything up there for a vote. Anyway, um, the third point I wanted to make, and I'll probably skip around a little bit here, but there is nobody on this council who doesn't want the best for Clarksburg and isn't trying to do things the right way. I think that there's a real attempt during things like this to... Uh, make them seem like they have no empathy, like they're cruel. You know, if I had just listened to the comments, if I didn't read the ordinance, and I didn't know what was going on, just listen to the comments, other than my own, of course, uh, I would think that if you just played me the comments and said, what do you think's going on here? I'd be like, oh, wow. This city, they must be evicting people from their homes right here before winter. You know, they're making people homeless. They're creating the problem. These people are awful. You know, they're just terrible, cruel people. Now I'm going to say this group of speakers tonight was not nearly as hyperbole as it was for some of these other events and comments I've seen online and stuff like that. It seems like this was a really, really level-headed bunch of speakers that um, even though I don't agree with everything they said as you saw when I was commenting on the few that went there I don't think they were terrible none of them had bad ideas um, I think a lot of them get off the subject uh, but this group didn't do nearly as bad a job as trying to make the council seem like evil because I felt like that was the goal of some of these other events in the last meeting. Um, but just a couple things I want to go over again that I kind of already mentioned. Um, this ordinance, actually I'm going to pause this and get the ordinance up on the screen here. And we're back. All right. So let's get back into this. An ordinance of the city of Clarksburg to create Article 1120 to prohibit camping on public property and unauthorized private property. Uh, I'm not going to read this word for word. But what I want to get into down here, let's not go over the definitions. Okay, here's just all the locations you can't camp. Storage of personal property in public places. Okay. Enforcement. This is where we want to concentrate. Okay. Violation of this article is deemed a public nuisance subject to summary abatement by any duly authorized official of the city and in all cases shall... Okay, blah, 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 blah. Okay, exceptions, blah, blah, blah. Viol penalty for violations. This is where we need to be. Any person who commits a first violation of any provision of this article shall be given a written warning describing the violation. Okay? We all good on that? B. Any person who commits a second violation of any provision of this article shall be subject to a fine not more than $200. Okay. C. Any person who commits a third violation of this provision, of this article, within 12 months of the first violation, 
shall be subject to a fine not more than $500. Not more than. Okay. Each day that violation continues shall be deemed a separate offense. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to find the part on here about criminal records and credit reports and imprisonment. As, as soon as I locate the part about imprisonment, I'll read it to you. Okay, nothing I can find on here about imprisonment. Pretty easy. I'm not a lawyer, but I got pretty good common sense and I can read really well. But let's go down here to under resources to be provided and read C. Okay. No citation shall be issued nor any criminal penalty imposed under this article, unless a person in violation of this article has been offered an alternate shelter and refused the offer. Well, that sounds really reasonable, folks. So, for purposes of this subsection, an offer of shelter means the identification by or on behalf of the city of an alternate location where the person may shelter overnight, including, but not limited to, a place in an emergency shelter or an alternate indoor or outdoor location where the person may sleep overnight. So, those threatened fines up there. Basically, what this is saying is, unless you just refuse to move no citation will be issued. Huh. Well, that doesn't sound like what the people in that meeting, in these previous meetings, were describing at all. So there's no imprisonment on here. I'll post this when I post the video separately if you want to read it yourself. But... But wow. I mean, if you just take the time to look at it and look at it from the council's perspective, I think you get a very different idea of what they're trying to do than if you gaslight one another and start using words like criminalizing and sending people to jail and, you know, hanging a fine on them that they don't have the money to pay. I feel like maybe I should read it again. I don't know, because it seems like this should be easy to understand. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and this will be the part where I make some people mad. I don't know. I don't know if I should even talk about that part. But the idea of what the council is trying to do here is open communication between the police officers and the homeless people. Now, they have communication a lot. But it's usually when someone has reported them for committing some crime. It's not going to be productive communication. It's going to be already mad by the time we start talking. Uh, it's like we're here because we got X complaint about you and we're here to solve it. And we're in cop mode. 
I feel like what's intended by this ordinance is to get them kind of out of cop mode and do more community policing. And I feel like the council could have done a better job of explaining that. I feel like we're really trying to communicate here and we're trying to open up to these people and have a reason to talk to them other than a crime. That's my way of seeing it. I, I, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding. You know, maybe... Like I offered, some of you can come on here and have a discussion with me. We can do a Zoom call or something, and we can talk about it, and you can tell me why I'm wrong. But I really think, even if people aren't seeing it that way, this is the council trying to help these people. Now, are we being a little bit forceful? Yeah. Is there a little bit of what Kevin said? Out of sight, out of mind? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know why the council would have any trouble admitting that. I don't have any trouble admitting that. Some of these people choose to be homeless. I only say some. I never, you know, people accuse me of putting a number on it or saying that all homeless people want to be homeless. That's BS, and I know it. If I ever have said anything like that, I apologize. What I'm sure of today and what i want to be very clear about though there are some and y'all know it i'm not telling you anything you don't know just like marissa's numbers she gave about the people that have had terrible lives and you know they're 640 percent more likely to be homeless okay i'm going to borrow a term from the late great rush limbaugh and that'll probably make a lot of you mad. But he really was a great radio broadcaster. Whether you agreed with him or not, he was entertaining. Uh, some people are homeless. To indicate that they want a home or they had a home and they no longer do. Some other people are what Rush referred to as urban outdoorsmen. They choose a lifestyle And no matter what kind of help you try to give them, that's the lifestyle that they're probably going to go back to. Maybe it's a mental health issue. Maybe they're even veterans. That is not what we're talking about here, though. Once again, we can't cure everybody's problems. The people that the city council is responsible for curing the problems of, straight up, folks, sorry to put it this way, it's the business owners and the voters. That's the people that put that city council there. You don't like that city council? I like the different one. You know. I can tell you, I'm not on that council now, but if I was, and there was a ton of money available to do great things with, I would be the first one ready to write the check and do some great things with that money there's just not that money folks that money's not there the money doesn't exist the other thing that bothers me that people keep saying is that um, you're just criminalizing them existing no I, I disagree with that very strongly too because maybe we are criminalizing and i don't even like that word because like i said there's no way for him to go to jail but we're saying we don't want you to hang out in clarksburg i mean that's that's the real that's the real thing here we are encouraging you to go somewhere else but we don't control the world folks city of clarksburg is around 9.7 square miles. 9.7 square miles. And we're not saying it's illegal to be homeless in the city of Clarksburg. It's just illegal to pitch a tent. Harrison County, 417 square miles. Clarksburg is 9.7 of that. We're a very small town, very small. 
What is it from one side of the Clarksburg to the other as the crow flies? I mean, we're 9.7 square miles, so it's like maybe four and a half from one side to the other. If you were like walking on Route 50, five miles, I don't know exactly. But So the last thing I want to talk about before I end this video Will Hyman talked about it a lot, uh, and several people speaking talked about it a lot. We can all agree that this camping ban doesn't change anything. We're not creating any new laws here. Uh, like I said, back to 2018 or 19, when I was elected to council, we started getting rid of these encampments. And there were a lot of them then, folks. There was, you know, giant camps. Not what we have now with two or three people staying in camp. Uh, there were huge camps with 30 people staying in them. And there wasn't one. There was like five. And they were much, much larger than anything that we're dealing with right now. And they were not allowed to exist once public safety became a large focus of this city. That's when it ended. Not today when this ordinance passed. Back then is when it ended. And you know, Will Hyman brought up giving them notice. Giving them more notice that they need to move their things. Let me be very clear. This is their notice. The fact that we are trying to change the culture of Clarksburg I think it's assumed right now by some, not very many, not as many as it used to be, like I said, but by some, it's assumed that if you need a place to camp out, Clarksburg is the cool place to be, man. This is where all the, all the stuff is. This is where all my friends are. This is where I want to hang out. Sorry, we don't want you here. Uh, Bridgeport doesn't have a camping ban. Do they need it? Probably not. Why? Because the homeless people already know they ain't going to put up with it. It's not going to happen. Their culture is strong. Bridgeport is already everything that we should try to be. So they can be above it. And they don't have to talk about it. Because before you even get your tent all the way up in Bridgeport, four police cars will show up. It'll be packed up before you can get your crap out of your bag. It's just not even an issue. Like I said when I was leaving the meeting tonight, it's just like this trash can issue that came up the last few days. The city sent out a warning. You know, we made an ordinance last year. You're going to have to start pulling your trash can in from the curb or we're going to fine you. It wouldn't happen in Bridgeport. You know, it's just that we have a bad culture here and people get away with it. We let people get away with it too long. Now we've decided we want to be a better place. And it's just taken a little bit of kicking and screaming for us to get people to go with us. This issue, trash can issue, very similar in my opinion. Because we put it out there, put the warning out there, and people start complaining. Oh, there's holes in the roads and trash all over the ground. And you're worried about trash cans getting pulled in off the street. I don't even know if Bridgeport has... Uh, warned anybody but I can guarantee you this if it's a day or two after trash day and you left your can out by the road in Bridgeport you would absolutely get a ticket I don't have any question you know how I know? because I can go drive up and down every street in Bridgeport and not find a trash can out sitting by the road why? why? you know why because they take pride in their city some people take pride in Clarksburg. I'm one of those people. I love this city. I want to fix it. I want to see it be great. Everybody doesn't. This ordinance doesn't change any laws, but much like a couple of other ordinances that were done while I was on city council and since then, we're drawing a line in the sand, folks. Today's the day that Clarksburg has decided we're not going to put up with this anymore. 
and that's it. Thank you if you've spent almost two hours listening to me. I hope I haven't completely wasted your time. There were a couple more speakers there I didn't have a chance to play, uh, but that video is available on YouTube. I'll share the link under my video if you want to go finish the parts that I didn't allow you to watch. And I want to once again say, if people want to have open conversation with me about this uh, in a public forum where you don't feel like you got the chance to speak tonight, I'll give you that opening. And I don't have a problem with anything any of those people said. I'll be 100% respectful to you and we can have a conversation about it. Anyway, thank you very much. And you all have a nice evening.